everybody. This is Teen Title Talk with Erin and Courtney. This is the podcast where two librarians discuss two YA books every two weeks. Today we'll be talking about the books The Field Guide to the North American Teenager by Ben Felipe. And Courtney, what did you read? Uh, this is kind of an epic love story by Karen Callender. All righty. Before we do that, we do have to talk about Courtney because she's leaving. She is leaving us. I'm, not really. Mm, We're not leaving mm. the podcast. No, hopefully I'm, I'm going to be with this podcast for a forever. long while. <laughs> forever until it's <laughs> over. I don't know how long that okay, will be. Okay, but congrats on your... Thanks. Want to talk about I am, that a Yeah, bit? sure. I'm, go, I'm going to a new library, yeah. which is very exciting. It's like a few towns over. What's it called again? It's called the Wigan Memorial Wigan. Library. Wigan, I keep being like yeah. Wigan. That's not right. In Stratum, New Hampshire. <laughs> um, I'll be the children's library, a children's librarian there. So. Awesome. I know you have fun programming for that, so they're lucky. But uh, we're going to make this work. So you won't, it's not like you won't hear from Courtney, but there might be, like, a little lag, we think, possibly, yeah, while, while schedules we, are figured out. Right, and while fine. we get, like, yes. Acclimated. Acclimated to the new everything. Awesome. But I'll be back. And then you'll be back, and you can tell us all about it. I can't wait. All right. Here's, uh, we're going to dip into the jar of teen angst, obviously. Uh, we have this time... Uh, a mix in our teen angst jar. We have teen angst and library life because sometimes we get library life questions from our patrons. Mm -hmm. So the first one is a teen angst question. Who were you most jealous of as a teen? This is so easy. (laughs) I was jealous. There's a girl named, should I say what her name is? Uh, Yeah, you could. Or make one up. Okay. Well, I'll call her. Sure. Her name was Kelly. Stardust. You like make up a fun name. But I don't have to <laughs> say her last name. Anyway. Oh, okay. She was sort of um when you think of a teen movie, like she <gasps> was a person from a teen movie, basically. Whoa. Like in seventh and eighth grade, she was wearing sweatpants. Summer happened, we went to high school. She had grown some inches. Uh-huh. She had developed some more (laughs) in different places Uh her hair was beautiful and shiny she wore makeup she wore mini skirts and she was always like perfectly put together oh my god also she was nice oh that's so nice she's just really kind and she still talked to all the people that she always was talking to okay so you were just like this person's got it all and i want to seem to have it all (laughs) yes so yeah that's who I would say I was most jealous of, which is mean yeah. a little bit to be jealous of her because... She was so nice. She was so nice. Yeah, but does jealousy yeah. really work that way? I mean, I'm glad you didn't more like, I don't get jealous because I hate it when people do that. No, oh, no, really? no. Is that a thing? It's probably that one of my worst flaws. <laughs> Me too. Because <laughs> I was like, who to pick? <laughs> I know. True. Kelly went to, like, she floated to the top, but um, I'm sure... Given some time, I could come up with quite a list. Right? I don't know. I was just thinking, like, it's proximity to whoever I was most Hmm. infatuated with at the time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, of course, Jason. I was specifically thinking of one time when, like, we ended up having, like, a mixed-up schedule. And we're kind of, like, interested in each other, right? So, we were, like, not asking each other to things, but also asking each other to things. And it was fireworks for the 4th of July. And I ended up going... And he ended up going, but with he got a ride from Tasha. Tasha. She was adorable. Uh, she was, of course she was. I was, I was seeing red. Uh-huh. <laughs> I was, like, so hurt and, like, angry. Did you confront Jason? Like, what were you doing in the car? No, I don't think so. I think I thought I was just like, I thought, I don't know. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> that was good of you. I know. <laughs> then he was late coming to my house like the next time and I started to get like oh so insecure and messed mm. up but he had been picking wildflowers to give me a bouquet of oh she just rolled her eyes <laughs> <laughs> that is very sweet he stopped all along the way oh my I, goodness yeah, I know. wasn't that's that so what sweet he said. yes he did have them and they were from all along the side of her because it's not like a flower that's type true you can pick they were like the... covered in bugs and yeah. stuff oh, love that that. Isn't that nice? So yes. yeah, but I have a jealousy problem. I'm like, I, I don't hate know it when why. people say that. I hate when they're like, "Oh, I don't do jealousy." I'm like, "Cool, good for you." Wow, you and your perfect life. I know. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, 
<laughs> All right, next question. <clears throat> what made you want to work in a library? And did you take certain classes in school to become a librarian? This is a great question. It is, because I feel like it's it's not obvious to people about it's, library school. <laughs> it's true, and I think the road to library work is different for, like, almost everybody. Yes. So I was, had a totally different job before I had this job. But what was it? Well, I had a hard time finding a job, like, <laughs> yeah, finding all jobs. Sorts of things. I didn't know where I fit in, so right. I was like, I sold wedding dresses at David's Bridal, mm -hmm, and I was I doing all kinds of stuff. I had gone to grad school but didn't know what to do with my degree. Right. Uh, and a friend actually forwarded me on, like, the job to posting, oh, cool. and Darian was like, hey, this sounds like something you would be good at. And I thought, right. oh. And a little something clicked in my mind because... When I first graduated from college, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know what I was prepared for. I had been an English major, mm -hmm. and everyone says you can do whatever you want with it, but I didn't know what that right. really meant. Of course. It was almost too broad. Broad. Almost, yeah. Um, yeah. And I had thought about museum work mm -hmm. or library work, but I was afraid that I wasn't smart enough. I had this <gasps> How dare you? I know. I had this, like, huge insecurity uh -huh. about whether I was smart enough to just, like, exist in the world. Uh -huh. And so I didn't try or go for anything because I was like, oh, I don't know. I'd probably not be very good at it so or you, whatever. You did your master's all while you were at, all while you were at Derry, or did you start that before? So I graduated from college with my English, my BA in English. Oh, okay, gotcha. And then a year later, mm -hmm. I was working at a hospital mm -hmm. after that because mm -hmm. I didn't know what else to do. So I worked in the medical records department, mm -hmm. and I. Hated it. Gotcha. So I was I like, oh, that. I gotta go back to grad school. <laughs> Isn't that <laughs> what everyone does when they don't know what to do with their life? Sure, why not? So I went to grad school for English because I thought I wanted to be a professor. Right. And I finished that, got my master's in English, which is a little bit useless, but it right. did help me get my job at the library. That's true. That's the thing. And mm -hmm. like ultimately, mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. later, and then while I was working at the library, I decided, you know what, this is like, this is what I want my career to be. Yeah. So that's when I went to library school. Yeah. And so, you know, for the librarians, like if you're a librarian who works at the reference desk, you have to do like usually all job applications ask for an MLS. Mm -hmm. And so the second part of that question is like, what certain classes did you take? You took a ton of certain classes to become a librarian. I did because I went to like a special library program yeah. for library and information science. And so I took, I mean, the classes are, they're kind of, it's kind of funny because you don't think about classes like how to organize books, you know, Yeah. but it's, there's a lot more behind organizing books than uh -huh. just like putting them in alphabetical order it's a so is a whole system <laughs> which has its pluses and its minuses mm -hmm. and you have to like weigh different systems and mm -hmm. plus there's um ethics yes an ethical component to being a librarian there's for some people they go sort of like technology yeah, event, exactly. and so there's a lot of like information technology people who have jobs that are not at a public library at all, but they're like still kind of librarians right. and they, you know, work at companies and stuff like that. So. Right. Wow. All different kinds of things you can do with your library degree, if that's what you choose. There are some undergrad library degrees. I think there's one. Are you serious? In some college in Maine. I can't oh, think of really? which one. Okay. has like a bachelor's in would library Would that give science. you like a, do you think that would get you like a reference to the librarian job or would you have to still do something more to get? I bet you at a small library yeah, or in a small town. It might work. You, it might help you get your huh. foot in the door. Gotcha. Yeah. I, on the other hand, didn't get a library degree, but what made you want to work in a library? I love books so much. I had my master's of fine arts and writing for children and young adults. So, mm -hmm. and I was tutoring. I was doing and the guys, same thing as you. I think it's important for everyone to know that an MFA is basically a PhD. Well, it's the for same creative. as that. Oh, right. <laughs> it's like, it's just like a master's of anything. But yeah, you do your creative thesis and you do your critical thesis and all that stuff. Um, but anyway, so... I worked as a tutor, and then I also was like, I'm going to pick up some library hours, and there was a part-time teen position in Drake It, which I qualified for. And hmm. uh, I went ahead, and I worked there for six months, and then I ended up getting a full-time job at uh, after-school education center, so I kind of left that a little bit. 
But then when I, I, that wasn't what I wanted to do. I was having the same thing as you, where I was like, this doesn't feel quite right. So um, when the part-time position opened in Derry for the teen librarian, I applied. And I qualified because I had managerial experience, plus I was an author at that point and had... um, That always helps. That always helps. And also Mm -hmm. having experience with teen books. Mm -hmm. I know that subject really well. So, um, so yeah, I didn't take any certain classes, but I feel like I learned a lot just from, I had Sherry there and Susan as my mentees. So I learned a lot on the reference desk just by asking and they always are very good teachers there. Uh, So there's so much that you can only just learn by being there. I know. I think so too. Cause some crazy stuff sometimes (laughs) comes up and you just don't know what to do. Exactly. Yeah. All manner of things. (laughs) <laughs> All right, last question. This is a teen angst question. What musical genre best describes your upbringing? Hmm. Can you think of one? This is kind of an interesting <laughs> question because it's like, does it mean... Or your childhood? That I listen to the most or just no, I don't embodies think so. your, that, my early life? Yeah. I think that's what oh, it means. It's probably a mix between like... Raffy <laughs> slash the Muppets. I love that. <clears throat> Any and all Muppet music. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, like 90s adult alternative. Wow. For all in the same <laughs> age span? Or are we yeah, yeah kind of. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's the best I, I could do. It. Although I do have such strong memories of like my mom... Getting out the record player, yes. which was old by uh-huh. then. Like, I was like, oh, look at that. Um, and she would put on her, like, Up With People wow. album. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know what that is. But... Uh, I think it was, like, a troupe of young people. And they there were many people in it. And they uh-huh. traveled all around the world. And they, like, lived in hostels or something. Cool. And they, like, sang songs okay. about peace. I love it. That's great. Injustice. <laughs> you would that. Yeah. If I had a hammer. Yeah, stuff like that. Little Peter, Paul, and Mary. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. But well, actually, I think Muppets really that's the covers one. the gamut. I think that's the one. <laughs> what about you? That's, that's great. a hard question. I was thinking indie folk album, mm. for sure. Mm-hmm. Maybe a little rock thrown in every once in a while, but indie. It's got to be like indie folk rock. That album. makes perfect sense to Does me. Does that make sense? With your boyfriend picking wildflowers yeah. off the side of the road and your dad yeah. having a farm. and Well, yeah, we have a field. It's a vegetable farm. There are chickens now. That is such a yeah, thing as a farm, is, though. I, I mean, know, I'm just saying. There are farms I didn't want in the Midwest you, that to are be, just soybean farms. I didn't want people to be imagining cows. Fair enough. So, yeah, indie folk rock. Interesting. That I did love the Muppets, sense. though, I just want to say. Muppets are my jam, too. I <laughs> watched all the Muppets. Yeah, they're barely um, lovable. I don't know. There is a thing about them. There's some Muppet Christmas Carol's the best one. Mm. Yep. That is. Listen 100% to it all the true. time. Love okay. it. Good. Live we it. agree. <laughs> all right. Let's go on to books. So tell me about, this is kind of an epic love story. All right. So this is kind of an epic love story. Uh, mm-hmm. Is about... I would say navigating normal, everyday love, actually, through the eyes of Nate Bird, who is the main character. He's a high schooler. He's got a great, solid group of friends. Um, But his old friend from fifth grade moves back into town, and that creates some drama. Okay. Among the friend group, because he's got, like, a new best friend that he's had for the past five years, and she... Gets a also, little bit. does it, like, sever the group? That's the fear, but actually that doesn't happen. They all just kind of <laughs> meld together. Um, but I actually think the book is really just about different kinds of relationships, like your relationship to your parents, your uh-huh. relationship to your friends, um, love and sexual relationships. Uh-huh. So it's just, like, navigating all those all different things because high school is a That's wacky, contemporary. wacky yeah. time. Yeah. Interesting. Uh-huh. Okay. <clears throat> what about... The field, the field guide. guide. The field guide to the North American teenager. Um, it was so fun. It was basically the story about Norris, who has to go from Montreal, Canada, to Austin, Texas, to live because his mom's job changes. His dad's gone out of the picture. He's married as a young kid. 
Um, so, he, mm. so Norris and Judith, his mom, are headed to Austin. Now, obviously, he has some preconceived notions about what Austin is like, and a lot of those are true. When he gets there, it's like cheerleaders and jocks, and he's like, everyone you know, does wear a ten-gallon hat. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite that far. But um, <laughs> then he has to acclimate to it and kind of figure out how to live like this. And is this home and the difference between where he wants to be and where he is. And he has the best wry, sarcastic narrator tone. It was just so fun. Just awesome. hilarious observations and just it, like deadpans everything. I, it would be like he would be my best friend as a teenager. Uh, just deadpanning that's everything. That's great. Being sarcastic together. I loved him. So he's a really fun, a unique perspective to see the story through. So we'll tell you a little bit more about that. But let me ask you questions about your book first. Okay. So I obviously read a little bit about this book. Uh, I wanted to talk about character because all of the reviews and descriptions of this book kind of boast big, unique characters. So what's all the fuss? Who are they? Yeah, the book is really character driven. Okay. <clears throat> um, That's what it seemed like. And they're all really interesting. They're all very unique. Mm-hmm. Um, it almost feels TV show-ish in that way. Like, each one has their own, like, role that they Mm. play. Okay. Um, but there's Nate, who's the main character. He lives with his widowed mom. His dad died, like, several years before. So it's really just him and his mom. His sister, Becca, who lives in Chicago, she's a freshman in college. Okay. Um, he's anxious, about love and relationships because he's kind of like been burned with the passing of his father Mm -hmm. and then like his girlfriend cheats on him. And so he just has a lot of anxiety around relationships, Mm -hmm. but he's a huge movie buff. He wants to be a screenwriter. Okay. So there's that going on in the background too. Then there's um, Florence who is a really great artist and uh, she is also Nate's ex-girlfriend slash current best friend. Okay. Which creates a lot of tension. Tension. <laughs> yes. And then there's Ollie, who is the kid from Away, mm-hmm. who, like, comes after five years. He had left, and then he came back. Um, he's a super talented photographer. So these are all kind of, like, oh artsy gosh, kids. Yeah. Uh, and he's really quiet. He's contemplative. Kind of like a dreamboat. Like, they talk about his nipples and how good-looking he is a lot. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, He's also hard of hearing. He uses sign Uh language. Okay. And uh, Nate can actually communicate with him because when they were best friends, when they were in elementary school, Nate learned sign language so that he could chat. I like that element. It's, like, different. You don't always see that. Yeah. And so they're all kind of, like... There are some other friends, too. There's Ash and Gideon, and they're sort of, like, mm, orbiting around mm-hmm. the other. But they have their own story going on Okay, gotcha. a little bit. Okay. But they're, like, not as fleshed out. Right. So. Gotcha. Yeah, so it's, like, this big just group of friends. It almost feels like friends. show friends. Okay. <laughs> where they all, like, go out with each other and are friends still, and then they break okay. up, but they're all still friends. Ah, okay. Yeah. Got it. Interesting. Okay, so... How about plot? Because my thing with the comp- contemporary, it's like sometimes nothing happens, <laughs> but something mm-hmm. has to happen, mm-hmm. you know, because it can't all be around emotion, although m- much of it can be in this genre. So uh, this one sounds like it's primarily about love and grief, both obviously huge things to deal with. But what do they do? Do they just go from like coffee shop to living room? Are there any epic school fights or how about like, was there any big action packed scene? What was the most action packed? Anything? You're giving me like a no, no. It was well, just school. no. I mean, it just kind of <laughs> did feel like, like your normal everyday stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. There are times I think that get built up by Nate because of his sort of anxiety, but right. then end up not being as big a deal as he thought okay, they would be. Gotcha. So like he's really there's a huge uh, like focus on his virginity. Okay. In a very like teen movie esque yes. kind of way. Got it. Like, oh, when are you gonna do something <laughs> about that, Nate? Um so, you know, that's kind of building and building throughout the story. Mm-hmm. And then when that issue gets resolved, it's right. like not as 
humongous as uh, well, or, you know as, as he, he like, like building exp- him up to yeah, be yeah right. gotcha of course <clears throat> and so stuff like that okay gotcha. so like things that seem really big yep. end up are just like oh that's just like life yeah so huh. that's kind of interesting it's almost refreshing but plot wise it's like you do kind of go from living room to coffee but shop to school that is sort of a realistic it is very realistic vibe. in that way um okay. there's also there is one moment involving ash mm-hmm. and gideon where ashley holds up this big sign like on the field at a soccer game in front of everyone, like, Gideon, will you go out There's with a big me? moment, okay. And everybody laughs at her, and it was, like, <laughs> Nate's idea to do it, okay, and gotcha. she's all upset. But then, like, that also resolves fairly quickly okay. and easily. Okay, interesting. And so I'm not sure if it's possible that the author is trying to show that, like, even things that seem, like, so embarrassing or, like, uncomfortable, they could it's just a literally moment. kill you. Right. It's really just a moment in time, and, like, everybody forgets it the next yeah. day. I mean, you could definitely read into that like that, sure. And so maybe, maybe that's where they were going with it, which, in a way, is, I think, kind of good. Yeah. But for, but like, book-wise, it's like, oh, and then nobody cared about that? Oh, okay. Gotcha. So I, I have, like, sort of mixed, mixed feelings, feelings about, about it. it. Gotcha. Yeah. All right, and I like the title. You know, this is kind of an epic love story. It sounds kind of voicey to me, and I thought it might be... Written in an interesting tone, but who knows? Can you give us a taste of one of your favorite passages? Is it just kind of like talking to a teenager? So, <laughs> it's like, is it chatty? And part, int- or part of Nate's story is that his father passes away, uh-huh. and he's really still processing like what this means yes. for his life. Because you know, as you grow, you change, sure. and having your parents around can be really helpful. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure. He seems like he wants to have lots of freedom, but his mom is scared to let him have a lot of freedom. And he's like, well, well right. that sounds... because I'm the only person you have and it's right. not my fault that, Dang. You, you know, like, but it's like a total, <laughs> you understand where yeah, you're coming totally. from because you're like, well, it's not, not really your, whole your life. fault. That's right? not, no. And so there's like the mom sort of learning to let go yes, and whatever, but um, he makes a lot of assumptions about his life. And what it would have been like if things had been different, like what his mom's life would have been like Mm -hmm. if things had been different. And Mm. he considers his mom's life like kind of like a fairy tale, like a fairy tale with an unhappy ending. Oh, dang. Right. And (gasps) so he thinks there can never be any such thing as happily ever after. Oh, okay. Because um, someone's always going to leave. Okay. Okay. For whatever Dang. reason. Um, and so, like, no matter how good things are, he's always waiting for the other shoe to drop. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I don't know. I identify with this. Mm-hmm. Like, m- both of my parents are still alive, but I uh, tend to err on the side of pessimism mm-hmm. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> um, and I was really scared to be vulnerable and open when I was in high school, like, I didn't have a boyfriend until, right. like, after college. Um, and I still think about, like, well, like, nothing can last forever. Yeah. Like, gotcha. <laughs> the thought just crosses my mind. But it crosses Nate's mind, like, all the time. It's preventing him from mm-hmm, living his life. Mm-hmm. And so um, that, that whole thing really, like, colors the whole book. So that, like, is kind of the tone of the story, is this, right. like, anxious tone and this kind of yes. anxiety tone. Yes. And as a result, Nate is kind of a jerk sometimes. Okay. Gotcha. As a way to, like, preserve his feelings yeah. or whatever. So, um... But anyway, so <clears throat> he's talking about it constantly. There's this one part that, um, his Be- Becca, his sister, comes home and... I don't know. Sometimes it's a little bit painful. Be- well, I shouldn't say painful, but <laughs> let's hear. Yeah. So he says, she frowns at me. Is this about you and Ollie? I shrug. Yeah. Well, why would one of you get hurt? Because someone always gets hurt. Aww. Becca shakes her head. You're always so pessimistic, Nate. It's not pessimistic to think that we might break up. It's realistic. There's a pretty damn big chance that we're not going to spend the rest of our lives together. So, she says when I make a face. She says it again, even louder. So what? You don't need to spend the rest of your life with Ollie to be in love with him now. Yeah, you know what? You probably will do something really shitty and idiotic. And Ollie probably will break up with you for being an ass. 
thanks. But even if that happens, that doesn't take away anything that happened before the present. The fun you'll have, everything you learn about yourself, nothing takes it away. So is it worth it? Yeah, it's worth it. Hmm. Okay. So and so, but that, like, there's so much of that okay. the whole time. The back it's and like, forth. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about the swears. That's okay. <laughs> I didn't even notice them. Were there some? Okay. There were. Sorry. <laughs> So I was going to ask you, so I think it kind of is coming through like they, that, that maybe the character can grate on your nerves. And I was going to ask you about pet peeve. So it, is that the pet peeve that you Yeah, he's kind of out? annoying. <laughs> Even he's though you feel for him, it's kind of Yeah, like... he sabotages his relationships all the time. Okay. Like he will like not call someone or text them back for like three weeks and they'll be like, well, what happened to you? And he's right. like, oh, well, and then you can't feel sorry for yourself. Figured that. that you hated me or whatever. Um, oh. or, you know, so he's yeah. always yeah. doing these things and everyone's like, everyone surrounding him is actually a really good friend. Mm-hmm. Except for maybe Flo who did cheat on him. So okay. that's like not, not the great, best, no. but, <laughs> um, she's trying really hard to still be a good person. Friend uh-huh. to him uh-huh. despite that like she just doesn't have the same feelings for him that he has for her in the like first three quarters of the book right and um but it's, she's frustrating too because she wants her new girlfriend and nate to be like besties yeah and he's like i can't really even look at her because she's the person that you cheated on me with so mm-hmm. ah. okay gotcha. so there's a lot of messy sort of yeah, dramatic relationship yeah, stuff going gotcha. on but yes he is kind of annoying Okay, so a last question. Would it make a good movie, and who would you choose to play Ollie? Ollie's a main character? Yeah, I want to no. know. Ollie's the someone who comes Ollie's back. Ollie's the one who comes back. Who would you choose to play Ollie? Because that mm. one sounds like a fun one. Honestly, I think this would be a really good movie. Okay. Like, I think I would like watching the movie a little bit better than I like reading the book. Okay, gotcha. So somebody give yep, Karen do it. Calendar, Calendar a book, I mean a movie deal. Um... I think I would like the movie a lot. I think people would like the movie a lot. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of like cool, interesting characters, and I think there's a lot of actors that you could get to be like. I think there's a lot of representation mm-hmm. that would be happening mm-hmm. in movies that would be great. But um, who would I cast? So yeah. I was like who thinking and thinking. So this is sort of surprising, but. I think that Rico Rodriguez, who plays Manny... I know who you're talking about (laughs) on Modern Family. Yeah, he basically, like, was like a baby for 100 years, but now he's 20. (laughs) (laughs) Now he's 20. He's he's an adult. And he's, like, he's kind of got the look. Like, he's got the cute dimples. He's got the curly hair that they talk about in the book. Mm -hmm. But also, like, he's got the acting chops. He's won awards. Mm -hmm. And I think that he is, like, I can totally picture him as, like, this, like quiet photographer type who like comes back and he's like got a boyfriend but he doesn't want to do long distance and it's like other thing and he doesn't know what to do and he's like trying to figure it out but also he's hard of hearing and also there's all these other things going on my god i think he can nail it all right let's do it yeah get it done he's a really he ends up being just like a really nice guy okay so gotcha yeah all right, cool. Mm-hmm. That's a fun one to end on. Yes, that was fun. Thank you. All righty. Fun question. Field guide. Field guide to the North American teenager seems to span yeah. the entirety of North America, <laughs> mm-hmm. Canada to Texas. Yep. So I ask you, uh, do you think that what it means to be a teenager is a regional thing? Like, do you think that there are differences between teenagers and Austin, Texas, and Montreal. I think there are some. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, the culturally speaking, it's it can be there. There are many differences, um, but and also just the even in the in the activities that uh, Norris has, obviously, like he's so excited about ice skating, but then he gets it like plunked down in football country, right? So it's mm. kind of those types of things that crop up. However. He does end up skating, and, like, he and Liam form a team. and So oh, there's so things know. that he kind of navigates still to his interests in this new environment and uh, finds what, you know, finds friends and mm-hmm. all of that. So I don't know. I don't know if being a teenager is based on region, but I think there are definitely cultural differences in different areas or even, I don't know, even in, in within regions. So... I think the biggest point of of this book is that he gets plunked down in a totally new situation, which he's hesitant to be in. 
Mm-hmm. And then he has to. He's That's four, not he even his choice. Right. He can't go anywhere else. He has to be there. And then it's like making the best of it. And then finding that, oh, you know, this cheerleader actually is like all the characters are, are great at evolve. He, the author does great having the characters be evolving characters and full of depth. And even though he might not think that at first, once he gives them a chance, it's kind of like, oh, these people are good people That's everywhere. That good is people fun. everywhere. There are good people everywhere. <laughs> so. Um, Cool. Did any of the story feel familiar to you Ooh. or even like a theme or something from your own life or stuff that gets done a lot in teen fiction or did it feel totally new and different? It didn't feel totally new and different in that it was like, oh, this is a new teen experience I've never read about. But because, you know, it basically does the same thing as yours where it goes from, you know, he where does he go? He goes from high school to his, to his job, which I, you know, had a high school job. Mm-hmm. And then he goes to ice skating, so that's his hobby. And then he goes home, and his mom and him are good. They have a good rapport. I think that it's really a sweet relationship. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, and yeah, I. It didn't sound. It didn't seem unfamiliar. What was so unique and fresh about it was the tone of the book and the sarcasm and the perspective. And obviously, um, Norris uh, feels like an outsider. Uh, he's fr- a black French Canadian, which I didn't mention at the beginning. Um, it doesn't play a huge role in the book, except that I think he feels like an outsider, maybe a little bit in Montreal, and then more of an outsider in Austin because he's now French Canadian, and he's in oh, and like the, the yeah, guidance say, counselor. I feel like initially, it'd be almost more diverse because Austin's well, sure. such a big right. But then there's that added layer of like French Canadian, so right? From another country, <laughs> exactly. Sure. And the guidance counselor is like speaking French to him at the beginning, and he's just uh, like, no, no, I, I speak English. Oh yes. And then the assumptions that people make about you for either being black or being French Canadian, you mm-hmm. know. So he kind of plays around with those things a little bit too. Um, and he's such this unique individual character. It's just so great to read the perspective. And I don't know, I just loved it. Um, so I'd say that was what maybe was a little more unique about this one than some contemporaries I read. Uh, I haven't read that perspective before, but for the most part, it just, like I was saying with the previous question, a lot of different, but a lot of the same. I can't <laughs> recall a single book we've talked about or even that I can think of in recent memory yeah. involving the French Canadian I know. experience. I don't much less the black exactly. French Canadian experience. Exactly. Which is probably its own bundle of interesting. Well, yeah, it was neat, but again, a lot of the same. Hmm. So, well, there you go. All right. Okay, so um the New York Journal of Books says mm-hmm. that the prose borders on lyrical and that the dialogue is sparkling did you agree can you give us a taste i can give you a taste i would not call it i mean i wouldn't think of lyrical i would say like sarcastic dry wry so if someone was looking for something funny would you be like pick this up yes gotcha um lyrical i always think of more imagery and metaphor and Mm. beautiful writing Uh very clear but it's the wit that's carrying it it's not lyricism i don't think Mm -hmm. um but again, it's beautifully written. It doesn't need lyricism. And I would have been like, oh, interesting. Because then that wouldn't have felt as much like Norris. Norris is just deadpan, observant. Uh, I want to read dry. it. So I'm going to give you, a, he has like these little things at the beginning of each chapter where he'll talk about, it's like the field guide part, right? So it'll say like guidance counselors. Appearance, tricolored plumage, stylish, quote unquote, glasses. <laughs> Feeding habits, half-eaten containers of light and fit yogurt known to linger on desk past 11 a.m., copious amounts of caffeine. Mating habits, thankfully not observed. (laughs) (laughs) And then, like, later on when he's just talking, you know, this is just his narrative. It's not the field guide part. There's just little gems everywhere, so it's like, you know, he's going on this date with Artie, and he's excited about it, and he's not really sure... (laughs) What he should say as she shows up, and um, boy, did, he says, "Boy, did that girl know how to make an impression." So they were now driving to the movie theater, and Norris, after hesitating on whether to compliment her on her earrings or her hair or her dress, had opted for all of the above by complimenting her on the entire situation. 
quote unquote, which he instantly regretted. My entire situation, she asked, an eye on the road. Yeah, you know, the hair and the dress and the stuff. You look good, but not in an objectifying way or anything. Just, she let out a laugh, not seeming to mind his choice of words in expressing himself, which, let's face it, definitely boded well for any long-term dating prospects. Mm. And then later he's talking about her and he go- he says, she'd gone through an anime phase, a tennis phase, and now she was into local politics. She hoped to take a year off before college and dislike millennials with the fiery <laughs> passion of a millennial. <laughs> So oh, I just thought that I was great. This, like, like fiery passion of a millennial. Who's which the is author? So true. Uh, ben Felipe. I think it's his, his debut. Oh my gosh! So it's great. I would read Spot definitely on the next one. With the he's observational reading. humor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, great stuff. Love it. Um, so you said before mm-hmm. that you would be best friends with the main character mm-hmm. Norris. Can you tell us a little bit more about him? Like, what makes him feel so real? I think the fact that, I think, the, first of all, the sarcasm and the humor makes him feel very unique and real. Um, also, it's, it's just the depth of every every sort of quirk and feeling. He doesn't seem like the, the author seemed very familiar with the situation, and I haven't read about the author, so I don't know if the author was, like you know, picked up during high school and had to move elsewhere. But it was just so realistic in the discomforts. Um, another thing that was really unique about Norris was that he he does have, like, sharp comebacks uh, that feel just, you know, something you want to say, which is why mm-hmm. I love that kind of mm-hmm. that. I think I want that as my best friend. Like, just something quick-witted and fast. Um but he would definitely get the best senior uh, sense of humor, superlative. Ah. He's there long enough for sure. Um, there's other things like he worked in the rest, working in the restaurant. Um, again, I like I said, the relationship to his mom, the wanting to wanting to have a relationship with his dad, but not quite. And he kind of reflects on those after all these like interactions. He'll make a little again with the observations, as you saw in that. Uh-huh. He'll um, he'll make little observational things, and it just made him feel very realistic, just That's like awesome. I would have felt as a teenager. Cool. Yep. Um, so my last question, we're running out of time. Mm-hmm. Um, did the narrative ever feel didactic? Like, was it trying to teach you a lesson? Because I did kind of get that feeling from mm. this is kind of an epic love story. So I'm curious to know about yours. Not even a little bit. I think that can happen if the characters don't have depth or, if, you know, obviously if the author's trying to figure something out. Like, it almost feels like they're figuring it out on the page and they're kind of pushing an agenda. Mm-hmm. But um, this one didn't feel didactic at all. It just felt like a very real story. Um, cool. Really cohesive and well done. So excellent, yeah, excellent. All right, well, let's talk about what's up next. All right, we'll be hitting up. I think we'll be hitting up novels in verse next. We'll see. We have to figure out our schedule. If not, I'll probably have Liz on to talk about who knows what. But mm-hmm. next time we're together, we're going to do Voices: The Last Days of Joan of Arc by David Elliott and The White Rose by Kip Wilson. Yeah. Uh, remember, if you get a chance to sign uh, to answer our three questions, those are it's actually two questions this time because the other was library life. Who were you most jealous of when you were in high school? And what musical genre best describes your upbringing? Likewise, if you have any questions about reading recommendations or library life, please write to us at teentitletalk at gmail.com and we'll read a few of our listener responses next time. Thanks for joining us for Teen Title Talk. This podcast is brought to you by the Dairy Public Library and DCAM, Dairy Community Access Media, empowering independent voices. As always, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, Google, and Player FM. Mm-hmm. Just search for Teen Title Talk. Don't forget to hit follow so you can hear the latest episode. Our theme was created and performed by Bandit Starling. Until next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.